Well, hello, Hope City Church. How we doing? Good? Just want to say hello to everybody here in South Louisville, everybody at Shepherdsville. Can we welcome everybody at Shepherdsville this morning? Wherever you are, however you're listening to this or watching this, we're just glad that we get to be together uh, for the next few minutes as we kind of start the Christmas season here at Hope City. I know some of you guys started the Christmas season eight weeks ago or so. Uh, that's fine. But for the rest of us now, we are starting the Christmas season and uh, really excited about that. And it is, it, since it is the start of Christmas season, it is the perfect opportunity for me to tell you the, only, the, the, real, the only real Christmas preacher joke that I have. I just thought that'd be a great way to start today. Maybe you've heard this. I probably have told it before because that's all I got. But uh, so the, the, the story goes like this. There was a little boy. His name was Johnny. And Johnny had been very bad, which sounds like something the little boys would be. And, uh, and so his mom said to him, you know, Santa is not going to be bringing you any presents this year because you've been really bad. He just begins to cry. And his mom says, well, but maybe if you wrote a letter to Jesus and asked him to help you and forgive you, that Santa would then be able to bring you gifts, which sounds like something that parents would say. And so little Johnny goes into his room and he grabs a piece of paper and a pen and he begins to write this letter to Jesus and he says, Dear Jesus, I'm so sorry for being bad. If you will tell Santa to bring me presents, I promise I will be on my best behavior for one year. He got done writing and he thought about it. He crumpled up the paper. He threw it in the trash. He grabbed another piece of paper and he said, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry that I've been bad this year, but if you'll tell Santa to bring me presents, I promise that I will be good for, for six months. He thought about it, crumpled up the paper, threw it in the trash. He grabbed another piece of paper. He wrote, Dear Jesus, I'm so sorry that I've been bad, but if you'll tell Santa to bring me some presents, I promise that I will be on my best behavior for three months. He thought about it crumpled up the piece of paper, threw it in the trash, and he was really torn because he wanted Christmas presents, but he didn't want to promise something to Jesus that he knew he wouldn't do, and he didn't want to obligate himself to good behavior, and so he couldn't figure out what to do, and so he thought about it, and he finally realized what he should do, so he goes back into the living room, he goes over to the nativity set, he grabs uh, the, the mother, Mary, the, the mother figurine, he takes it back into his room, he puts the Mary figurine in the closet, closes the door, grabs a piece of paper and writes this, dear Jesus, I have your mother, if you ever want to see her again. Yeah, so that's it, that's my, that's my Christmas joke. I'll try not to tell it next week, but that's what I've got, and uh, we're excited to get this started. That sounds exactly like something that my boys would do. I don't know. Maybe that's why I like it so much, but uh, yeah. So we are starting this series, uh, and we're just calling it Advent, and you're probably familiar with that phrase, and depending on how you were raised or your religious upbringing, you may be familiar with some of the things that we're going to be talking about, but I think for a lot of us in the room today... Uh, what we're going to hear over the next four weeks is going to be kind of new, and, uh, and I'm excited about that. The word Advent just it literally means, the definition, uh, definition, the dictionary definition of Advent just means the arrival of a notable person, the arrival of a notable person, which is pretty self-explanatory for this season. It's pretty straightforward. We are celebrating Advent to celebrate the arrival of a, a pretty notable person. Uh, and, that, and that obviously was Jesus. And for those of us who believe in Jesus, this is significant because we're not just celebrating that he arrived, because he did. We're not just celebrating that Jesus came. That's what this season is about. But we're also anticipating that he will arrive again. You need to know that for everybody in the room who believes in Jesus, that it's not just the, hey, he came one time. It's that he will Come again. And so Advent is this opportunity for us to celebrate what has already happened and to anticipate what has not happened, uh, what has not happened yet. Advent is a practice for Christians as far back as 480 AD, even though nobody knows the exact time uh, when it started. But, but a lot of our Christmas traditions uh, come from Advent. Uh, putting up a Christmas tree is it originally started as an Advent. Putting up Christmas decorations, 
lights and, and things. That, that, that started as, as an Advent uh, tradition. Now, let me tell you why we're taking four weeks to talk about this. Um, but to do so, I need to just sound like a grumpy old man for like two minutes. If you'll just give me a chance to just, just two minutes to sound like a grumpy old man, uh, then I'm going to explain to you why I think this is so important, all right? Back before Amazon two-day shipping and Black Friday and, and National Lampoon's great, uh, vacation, Christmas vacation, and all the, you know, the traditions or things that you do for Christmas, Christmas was a, a Christian celebration specifically uh, created for believers to celebrate the birth of Jesus and to anticipate the eventual return of Jesus. So, so when Advent started, nobody was getting a Lexus in the driveway. Nobody was going to Jared's, all right? That was not what Christmas was, was about, right? And uh, two years ago, my, my nephew Tucker uh, he brought, he, he wrote out a Christmas list and he brought it to his parents. And I, I thought this was just kind of a, a great example of the tension that we all feel between what Christmas was and maybe what it has become. But uh, my nephew Tucker, I think he was seven at the time, I think. Um, and he brought his mom and dad, my, my brother, uh, his Christmas list. I want to read this to you because it's fantastic. Uh, this piece of paper at the top, it said Tucker wants, and then he listed his Christmas list. Tucker wants a refrigerator, a pool table, a thousand dollars that is real, which is a, an important clarification there, a bookshelf, a hundred books, a surfboard, they live in Georgia, 10 picture frames, a shed, a candle, and 10 packs of flowers. This was Tucker's Christmas list, and it's just a great example of how easy it is for us, and we do this as adults, we especially do it as kids, we tell our kids to do it, but how that Christmas can become for us a time of figuring out what we want, figuring out what we can get, um, and, and I think this shows that. And while we still celebrate Jesus and we include him in our holiday festivities, I think if we're being honest, we would admit that the Christmas season has become more about gifts and shopping and office parties and ugly sweaters or, you know, whatever, then about a real celebration of the significance of the arrival of Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that Christmas is not supposed to be a celebration. On the contrary, it's actually supposed to be a massive celebration because there is no greater gift that has ever been given than Jesus Christ coming to earth and giving his life so that we could know God. That's the best gift you could ever get, right? And so we do celebrate that, but we are celebrating that Jesus left heaven. He came to earth as a baby. He lived. He died. He rose from the dead. He went back to God, and now he is the way that we get to know God. That is what we are celebrating, and that is so much better than wireless headphones, even though wireless headphones are great. Like, it's better than that, you know? Even though big screen TVs on sale for $198, even though that's great, it's not as great as that. It's not as great as that. So what we want to do for the next four weeks is walk through the, the four weeks of Advent celebration together. And if you grew up celebrating kind of the rituals of Advent and this, like, makes you break out or something because you feel allergic to how you were raised or something like that, don't get nervous, all right? I know some of you have had experiences like that. That we're not, this is not obligation, Advent's not in the Bible, uh, or anything like that. This is just a chance for us to refocus and to kind of realign our hearts towards the reason for, for celebration, okay? Now, there are four weeks of Advent, and each week has a different theme that we're going to talk about during the series. Number one, the first week is hope or expectation. The second week is faith. The third week is joy, and the fourth week is peace. So hope or expectation, faith, joy, and peace. So today, uh, let's start by talking about expectation. What does Christmas have to do with expectation? Why is it that as believers in Jesus, we should uh, live with, with expectation? What does it look like to, to do that? And we're going to talk about all of that today, all right? 
Now, the very first book of the New Testament starts with a chapter that you have probably skipped over if you've ever uh, decided to try to start reading the Bible. And somebody said, start with the New Testament. So you were excited. You grabbed your Bible. You started with the New Testament. You opened up to the first chapter of Matthew, and it is just a list of names. That's all it is. It's a, it's a genealogy. It's Ancestry.com for Jesus, right? And so you are all excited to start reading the Bible, and it's just like names. And they're hard names, too, by the way. Like, you got you to gotta read some tough names. And that, that list is very significant if you're Jewish, but if you're not Jewish, eh, we'll skip that, right? That's kind of how we, we read through that. And so maybe you've done that before, but the first chapter of Matthew is very important for those of us who believe in Jesus because it tells us how Jesus got here. Now, we know God sent Jesus, but God used a family to get him here, which is pretty amazing. And so even though we're not going to read the whole list together, we, we are going to read one verse, and it's in Matthew chapter 1, and it's verse 17. It's on your sermon guide. If you got one of those when you came in, uh, make sure you have that, because we're going to be using that today. But verse 17, just one verse that kind of summarizes this for us. Here's what it says, verse 17. It says, all those listed above include... 14 generations, all those listed, by the way, is the list we were just talking about. All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham, you've probably heard about him, to David, you've probably heard about him. 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, which you may not know much about, but that was pretty big. And then 14 generations from the Babylonian exile to Jesus, okay? So pretty much the whole Old Testament is summarized by this verse, that once Adam and Eve sinned, And God began his plan to send Jesus to save the world. It took 42 generations for everything to happen. And their generations were not like our generations, okay? They they lived hundreds of years at times, all right? And, And so it wasn't just like every 50 years, but it was 42 generations, thousands of years, thousands of years. People would read about a king that was gonna come. He was going to come, this king, and, and they would read about it and get excited about it, and I'm just going to read you one verse. It's not on your sermon guide, but I just want to read you one example. If you were living during this time, like if your name was on that list or you were related to somebody on that list and you were living during that time, you would read verses like what I'm about to read to you from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 about the king who was going to come. And this is what it says in in verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 9. You've probably heard this before. It says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. Now, if you were growing up in these 42 generations, a lot of those generations were slaves in Egypt. Then they were free for a while, but then they were captured by the Babylonians. So then they were living in a place that wasn't their home and they were being told what to do. And so you can imagine if you were alive during these times when you were not free, when you were being bossed around and told what to do, and someone keeps telling you there is a king that is coming and he is going to be so awesome. I mean, he's going to be, he's, it's going to be so much better than this, and he's going to run the government, and he's going to be amazing, and he's going to be for us, by the way, because he loves us, and, and, and this is what you're reading, and this is what you're expecting, and this is what you're anticipating. Words like wonderful, and mighty, and everlasting, and prince of peace that will never end, fair and just, these are all words to describe the king who was going to come, 42 generations. 42 generations, thousands of years. If you were Jewish, you would read verses just like this one along with a bunch of other ones. There were thousands of them, by the way, all throughout the Old Testament talking about this king who was going to come. Now, everybody's favorite king was King David. He was the best king. But this king that was coming was gonna be so much better than King David. And he was coming. This was going to be epic when the king comes. So much better, so much more wonderful, so much more just, so much more powerful than anything he, 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 we've ever experienced. He's coming. He's going to come. He hasn't come yet, but he will come. And as I was reading this week, kind of just reminding myself about 
these thousands of years that people were expecting Jesus to come. Pardon me for just using an example this week, and this is going to hurt some of you guys. I don't mean to do that. But it felt, it, it, it reminded me of this week as the Louisville football team was waiting on their coach to come. Now, I'm not trying to rub it in because it was painful. I get it. But but if you were on Twitter, you were refreshing Twitter like every 20 seconds. You were texting your friends. You were listening to Sports Talk Radio because there was a coach who was coming. And he was going to be so much better than the other coach. And he, he was going to win football games and he was going to lead us back to where we needed to be. And he was coming home and he was our guy and he's coming. He, it's a done deal. He's going to be here. He's coming. He's not here yet, but he's coming. Has he come yet? No, he's not come yet, but he's coming. And so there was like 20 hours there if you are a sports fan. Some of you are like, huh? Just don't worry about it. But if you are a sports fan, there was like 20 hours where it was like, is he coming? Is he coming? For 42 generations and thousands of years, that was the type of excitement and expectation that these people have lived with, refreshing Twitter. Like, is he here yet? Has he come? And so expectations building and they're waiting. And they're waiting. Now, I, I have got to be honest with you about, about myself. I, um, I build up everything in my head to such degrees that nothing can ever live up to the hype that I create in my head. Maybe you have a friend like this. I don't know. But if you ever tell me, Jason, you really need to go eat at this restaurant because it, it was good. It was really good. What I hear you say is, this will be the greatest bite of food you've ever tasted in your life. So I go, I eat it. You say, how was it? I go, meh, it was all right. Because I had built it up. If you say to me, hey, you really need to go see this movie because it was good. I hear you say, this is the greatest movie you will ever see ever. And so I go see it. It was good. You say, how was it? I go, eh, it was all right. Because it built it up. If you say to me, hey, Jason, we want to take you out to dinner for your birthday. What I hear you saying is you are the decoy because they're setting up a surprise party <laughs> that everyone will be at. So you're like, what time? I'm like, whatever time you think. Where do you want to go? Wherever you want to go. Got it. All right. <laughs> That's just how my head works. I don't know, right? And so you just got to know about your pastor that if there's ever a time where where expectation and hype and suspense is building. I'm all in. And I am building, I'm building it up, right? And so imagine generation after generation after generation reading and hearing about and talking to their grandfather about this king who is going to come. He's, I, I promise you he's coming. He's coming, right? One day, he'll be here. But generation after generation dies, and the king hadn't come. Where's he at? Now, God was still doing things, right? Prophets were still prophesying, and miracles were still happening. God, God was doing things. But the king that was promised, that God had promised to send, was still a no-show. And listen, as you might expect, there were people who made their living off figuring out and predicting when he would come. They had their charts. They had their books. These are the people who go like 48-week Revelation Bible studies on Wednesday night. These are those people. They're excited. They're ready. They're looking for all these things. They know exactly when he's going to come and where he's going to come and what he's going to look like and how he's going to arrive. They know. But guess what? They died too. They didn't come. And maybe their kids take on their excitement for studying and analyzing, and they know exactly when and where, and they write a book saying, you know, the king will come in 780 AD, but then in 781, nobody buys the book because he didn't come. He's not here yet. No king. And then it gets real bad. The very last book of the Old Testament is a book called Malachi. It's just four chapters. But in this book, God is speaking through Malachi for four chapters. God uh, speaks through Malachi. Malachi speaks. And when Malachi gets done at the end of chapter four, God stops speaking. No, no, no exciting church services, no goosebumps, no feeling God, no miracles, nothing. God goes dark. God goes silent for a year, and then another year, and then a decade, and then another decade, and then a century, 
and then another century. For 400 years, nobody hears from God. I mean, no, 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 no Bible study, no, no, no preacher, no, like nobody hears from God. People still believe in God, but he doesn't speak. No messages in a bottle, no fingers in the cloud. No one hears from God. He's silent. He's absent. 42 generations, around 2,000 years, 400 years of silence, and the king still hasn't come. And then one night, out in the middle of really kind of nowhere, that nobody's paying attention to, there is this 15-year-old girl, and I don't know what she's doing, but she's 15, so she's probably in her room with the door closed, and she's probably scrolling through Instagram or whatever it is that you do at 15 in your bedroom, and she's there, and she looks up, and in her room is an angel. Now, that would be crazy in and of itself if an angel's in your room, but remember, for 400 years, no one had heard from God. No, no angels, no messages, no nothing. Silence. 400 years. She had probably heard stories about, you know, eight generations ago when people had heard from God, but he didn't do that anymore. And here she is in her room, and there's an angel. It's not just any angel, because any angel would be great, but this is Gabriel. And I don't know how they rank, but he's up there, okay? And so he's in the room. And he looks at this 15-year-old girl, and this is what he says. I want to read it to you. Luke 1, it's not on your sermon guide, but I'll read it to you. Luke 1, 26 through 33, here's what, it, here's what it says. It says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. Well, yeah, 400 years. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, which is pretty accurate, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, you probably know how the rest of the story goes, but, you know, Jesus lives and does ministry and he dies. He, he, you, you know, this is the king that was to come. He was here. But I thought that for the first week of Advent, it was important to remind us that the story of Christmas doesn't start in Luke chapter 1. Depending on your traditions, maybe a, a granddad or a dad or somebody, you get together maybe on Christmas Eve or, or maybe you go to a church service and somebody says, we're going to read the Christmas story and they grab the Bible and they open it up and they, they begin to read around Luke chapter one or Luke two. Maybe you start at Luke two. They've already, you know, they're on the donkey. They're already heading out of town, wherever you start the story. But that's not where the Christmas story starts. The Christmas story starts 42 generations and thousands of years earlier when people lived their life with anticipation and expectation of a king that was going to come. He was going to come. Now, we as Christians today, we get to celebrate that he came. And so, you know, Advent, depending on your traditions, maybe you kind of like role-played or reenacted the excitement of him coming. One of my favorite stories of that is Pastor Joe was telling me this week that um, his dad, they would set up the nativity scene and his dad would start the wise men somewhere way away from the nativity and every day just move the wise men closer and closer. I, I'm stealing that. That is fantastic. We don't have a nativity set right now because our kids would throw it, but in a couple of years, we're going to get one, and I'm going to do that. And so, um, but maybe you kind of like role play this anticipation or this excitement, like he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, you know? But we don't have to live and act like we have to manufacture anticipation for a king who's already come. Because as people who believe in Jesus... We get to celebrate that he came, but we also, like the 42 generations of people who showed up before that angel spoke to Mary, 
We get to live with anticipation that a king is coming that is so much better than anything we've ever experienced. We've ever experienced. And so if you believe in Jesus, you should be living with expectation and anticipation. You should be doing that. And so what I want to do for just the time that we have left today is I want to give you three ways or, or, or three expectations that those of us who believe in Jesus should have. And these are on your sermon guide if you want to write these in. But as we start this Advent season and, and, and we're talking about expectation and hope, anticipation, for those of us who believe in Jesus, there are three ways or three uh, expectations that we should all have. Number one is this. If I believe in Jesus, I should expect him to return. If I believe in Jesus, I should expect him to return. And depending on how you were raised religiously, you may have never talked about this. Some of you, maybe you were raised a little more like me, and it's all they ever talked about. It's all the songs were about. It was just he was coming back, which is amazing. Uh, but, but it may be something that is not, you don't think about it that often. But Jesus will return. He will. He will come back. And either we will be gone and, and passed away, or we will be alive and we will go with him, but he will return. And the Bible tells us that if we believe in Jesus, we should live with an expectation that he will return. I want to give you an example of this in Philippians chapter 3. It's on your sermon guide, verses 20 and 21. Paul's writing and he says, but we, talking about everybody who believes in Jesus, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eager. Everybody say eager. eager. We are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. And he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. This is who is coming and what he will do when he comes. And so Paul says that for those of us who believe in Jesus, we should live eagerly waiting for his return. I begin to think, like, what in my life do I eagerly wait for? What does it look like? What does it feel like to eagerly wait? And, and, and I'm just trying to think because we're, we've got really so spoiled that like we don't really have a lot of buildup for much that we really, we don't wait much in our lives. And, and the best example that I could think of was when you order a package and, and you have tracking on it and you are so excited for that package to get here. Like depending on if it's like the new iPhone or if it, I don't know what it is, whatever, you, you know, your essential oils kit or whatever, it's coming in and you're really excited about it. And so somebody gives you a tracking number, and, and so immediately you begin to track it, and it's like, it's going to be here in five days, which irritates you because shouldn't everything get here in two now? I'm not sure how that works, but anyway. And so you track it, and you check it every day, even though they already told you when it's going to be there, but you're thinking maybe it made the early flight. Did somebody grab it and put it on a truck early? Uh, you know, what's going on? And so then, it, then it's the day of delivery, it's out, and it's coming, but you're refreshing, you know, like, when is it going to get here? Why have we not added, you know, minute-by-minute minute updates to this yet? And, and, and you know, if, if you're really excited about it, you work from home, and then you're like, you don't ever want to leave because it's going to be there sometime around 10, but it's 11.45, and it's still not there, and you're refreshing. Is this just me? Just me? I don't know. Okay. So you're like, well, I'm just going to run out real quick, and I'll be right back. And then you go, and you come back, and you see it, the sticker on the door. <laughs> you waited all day. You're gone 15 minutes, and they came while you were gone. And so you're calling. You're, you're getting in your car. You're driving around the neighborhood looking for the truck. You can find it. Because you're looking for the package. Or maybe, maybe you're not home, but you know it's going to be dropped off at home, and so you're refreshing, you're refreshing, you're refreshing. And it says delivered. And you're pulling your driveway, and, 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 you, and you see it. That feeling, is it here yet? Is it coming? When's it going to be here? What do you mean it's delayed? That, Paul says that that is how those of us who believe in Jesus should be waiting for him to return. Has he come yet? Is it here yet? 
Could it get here any sooner? Can I call somebody to get it here any sooner? I don't want to miss it. I don't want to go out for 20 minutes because I may miss it, and I don't want to miss it. I should be eagerly expecting his return and making sure that I'm, that I'm ready. And so if I believe in Jesus, I should expect him to return. But number two, if I believe in Jesus, I should expect this world to disappoint me. If I believe in Jesus, I should expect, go ahead and expect it, that this world is going to disappoint me. Why? Because Paul told us in Philippians 3, we are citizens of heaven. This is not our home. This system is broken. This world is broken. And so you probably, if I had you tell your story, and we hear it week after week after week on our hope stories, you could tell your story about how you put your hope in something here, and it let you down. It disappointed you. And, and all of us, it's not a good Christian, bad Christian, super spiritual, not spiritual type of thing. All of us every day are tempted to get more excited about something here than something back at our home in heaven. And, you know, we could joke about, like, the small things like sports teams and gadgets and trips or Disney or whatever, but if we really wanted to get into the real issues that really tear at our hearts, this would include our children, our spouse, our careers, that if your hope is in your children, they will disappoint you. If your hope is in your spouse or your future spouse, they will disappoint you. Our only hope that never disappoints is Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said it best because he's C.S. Lewis. This is what he said. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Some of you are here today, you're listening to what I'm saying, you're not, you, you don't follow Jesus, you, you're not a believer, you have not committed your life, and you wonder why dead end after dead end after dead end continues to happen, you get excited about the next thing, but the next thing lets you down, you find him or her, you get the new job, you have the new place, whatever it is, and you cannot figure out why you keep being disappointed, it's because you were never made for this world. And so if you believe in Jesus, you should expect him to return. If you believe in Jesus, you should expect this world to disappoint you. But let me give you one more. If I believe in Jesus, I should expect things to get better. You know, if you deal with enough disappointment from this world, it's very easy to become cynical and jaded, to never get your hopes up to never expect anything good to happen. And we know that this world cannot live up to heaven, but the Bible also teaches us that for those of us who believe in Jesus, things in this world can and will get better. That we have Jesus Christ, we have him, and he is our hope. And so it is 100% okay for us to get our hopes up and to be filled with faith about this world. This world is not everything. But the Bible says that every good gift comes from the Father, that there are things we get to experience here. And so if you're here today and you're walking through physical sickness or pain and you're wondering when or if it's ever going to get better, you should live with an expectation that it will. If you're parenting a child who is going in the wrong direction, you should live, because you have Jesus, you should live with an expectation that it will get better. Christians, in my opinion, should be the most optimistic people in the world. Your neighbors and the people you work with, let me tell you what they don't need. More cynicism. More negativity. They need a hope-filled believer in Jesus who lives with expectation. And when the world is wondering or assuming that everything bad is going to happen or whatever it is, you are the light of the world that stands up and lives with expectation because you have Jesus. And so during this Christmas season, as we are, you know, buying the gifts and doing the parties, and those things are great. 
I want us to figure out times in those stretches for ourselves, for our families, for our children, where we can stop and pause and just take some moments to think about the fact that he came. Jesus left heaven and he came so that you and I could know God. And then he tells us in John 14, 3, I'm going to go away, but I will return for you. And so we are excited about the headphones or the Disney trip or the cruise or the shirts or the gift cards or the uh, whatever it is, the peppermint lattes, whatever they are. We're excited, but nothing comes close to Jesus Christ returning and us being with him. And so we live And we wake up every day saying, God, help me to live with eager anticipation and expectation that you will return. And that's better than anything that I could put my hope in here in this world. Let's pray.